know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, today our study is on the third sign that Jesus performed as he was going about his ministry, and these signs are are recorded in the Gospel of John. And so today I'm going to be reading from, uh, I'm reading from John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who, has, who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Well, I've been to Jerusalem, and I'll tell you, that's really a spectacular place to see. You see a lot of the things, you know, as far as reading the Bible, the things that happened in Jerusalem and in times when Jesus was in Jerusalem and where things happened. And I've been to these pools of Bethesda. And when I say pools, it's plural. There was excavation, and what remains are, you know, quite a number of pools, and it you know, it was a very, it's a very impressive place even to see today. We've got Roman colonnades, and you've got these fancy pools, so it's all the way in which the Bible is describing it here. And so these, wa- these pools of water is what would happen is that apparently there would be some undercurrents that would, you know, would swell, the water would swell and would begin to, to swirl around a little bit like a, a whirlpool. And, of course, what they believed was that an angel would stir the pool. And the first one who would get into the pool would be healed. So I don't know about you, but if you had a place like this, you know, where sometimes, you know, your knees, they may be creaking and crackling a little bit, on your back, you better watch out how you bend over because your back may just pop. You know, the shoulders just don't seem to work like they used to. And so we're always kind of looking for a pool of healing, a place where we can go to say, oh, I'm healed. I know I've taken a couple of trips out to South Dakota and there's hot springs and now it's kind of this natural pool where the water is warmed, and I think over, you know, over the years, people have always felt like there's some, some healing 
uh, properties to all of this, and so we want to go to the hot springs and just kind of jump into the pool there. But for a lot of us, it's a matter of maybe going into a whirlpool, uh, you know, a hot tub. Oh, does a hot tub ever feel good? You fill up the tub full of hot water, and then pretty soon you got, you know, all the jet propulsion going around, making it into this whirlpool. You know how good it makes us feel. But then a lot of times now, it's, it's filling the tub not with hot water, but with cold water. And you got to sit in there because, you know, all the cold water is deflaming all of the tendons and muscles, you know, that are inflamed because of injury. And so that does make us feel better too. And so I think we get the point, saying, yeah, you know, with some of my aches, aches and pains, I'd be heading down to that pool. It's that place where I could get some relief. And so a lot of people would be there. And when you think about it, you know, I'm kind of being a little silly here when I'm talking about what I've been just talking about, but when we have chronic illness and chronic pain, it's not fun. And we are looking for relief. And maybe we're thankful that we're living in a day today where, where there is relief from pain and there's uh, new uh, methods as far as uh, massage, chiropractic, the doctors, sometimes surgeries, things that can you know, take away the pain and make us better. But then other times it's like, well, there's not anything that really can, can cure us. Maybe we can have a little bit of relief. But it's tough. And when you look at the pools there, the pools of Bethesda, that the pools of Bethesda, that there were a lot of people who had infirmaries there. But here is a man who was there for 38 years. 38 years. Now that's chronic illness, to be living with a problem for 38 years. But what this means a lot of times is that when we have some kind of a physical ailment or a problem is that we learn to live with it. We develop all those coping mechanisms in our lives to say, well, this is now how I cope. And in some ways, now to be made well, it's almost kind of frightening because my whole life has been now designed with all these coping mechanisms that if I were to be well, I don't know how I would actually go about life because I've got my whole life set up right now. And so that can be very real. These are the people, these are the things, these are the places, this is all my environment of how I manage in life. And so to have a new life meaning that I don't have this illness anymore, what is that going to look like? How am I going to live my life? In some cases, it might be even be a little bit frightening. It's like a prisoner who has been in, in a prison for many years and now is released. You know, I've gotten so used to my environment in prison and I've actually done quite well that now to be released, it's like, I don't know how I'm going to survive in the world. It's a different world out there than when I came in and... You know, all these issues. But here was this man for 38 years, and as Jesus is there, just kind of Jesus talking to him, Jesus has mercy upon him. In fact, when you look at names in the Bible, even the names of communities, it's always interesting, you know, what, what it means. Like Jerusalem means city of peace. But whenever you have in the Bible, like... <laughs> In the Holy Land, whenever you have Beth, Beth means house. And so it's going to be Beth meaning the house of something. And so when you have Bethlehem, that means the house of bread. Well, then on the Sea of Galilee, you have a city called Beth Seda. And being on the city, a city right on the Sea of Galilee where there's so much uh, fishing, so much of so the fishing industry, well, it only makes sense that Bethsaida means the house of fish. 
And so Bethesda means the house of mercy. That this is where people now go to find mercy is at these pools. Maybe in some ways we would say it's the house of healing. And so here is this man, he's going to this house of healing, he's going to this house of mercy, these pools. He's been there for 38 years. You'd almost think that they would have a more organized system here where you maybe can have an appointment, you know, like kind of going to the doctor's office. Well, you know, it's uh, my day to be here or that you pick a number. Okay, well, my number is 125, and so I've got to wait 125 days, and when that time comes, I will be able to jump into the pool. But that's not the way it is, and it kind of shows how the lack of mercy, it shows you know, just how selfish people can be. But here again, when you have a critical need, all you can think about is getting well. You're not always sensitive to those who are hurting around you. I mean, it's like if you're hungry, you're not concerned about all the hungry people of the world, all you're concerned about is where do I get my next uh, loaf of bread, my next meal. And once I'm fed, then I'm going to be able to help others, you know, and to feed them. And so that's the whole thing is that, you know, people when they are hurting and sick, they're not concerned about the person who's in the back of the line. They're going to jump in because they want the healing this day. And you know, we talk about all kinds of things about health care. For instance, like socialized medicine or universal health care for everybody. Oh, the people that get upset because, meaning, well, I'm not going to be able to get the good health care that I need. I'm not going to be able to see the doctor that I want to see today. And I can see, you know, when we're not feeling well, that's kind of how we're feeling. It's just like the rest of the world, they can just remain crippled up as long as I get the health care that I need. And so here again, I'm not necessarily arguing for one thing or the other. I'm just saying we all need to be sensitive. We're all in the same boat. And that what concerns me also concerns others. And what concerns others concerns me, so to speak. And that we all just need to have some compassion running through our veins, you know, to allow, you know, good things to be happening for all people. Because after all, that's what God desires. Jesus just didn't die for a few. He died for everybody. Okay, so getting back to the pools. And so Jesus comes to the pool and he sees this man. And he asks him the question, well, do you want to be healed? And so Jesus must have known some more things about this man than what we know. And that's why I was kind of saying, you know, some of these things about the learned helplessness is that sometimes when a better life is offered to us, we don't want it just because we're afraid. You know, I don't know how to live this new life. I don't know what it would be like to be well. I don't know what it would be like to be free from prison. I'm used to my environment. I have my coping mechanism. Everything is fine, but yet he was there. And so he just simply said to Jesus, well, nobody's able to put me in. And what is so special about Jesus is that Jesus heals the man right there. You know, you'd almost think, well, Jesus, I'll get on your mat and I'll kind of pull you and I'll kind of <laughs> shove you into the pool and I hope that you can learn how to swim fast. No, Jesus doesn't do that. The man never enters the pool. Jesus heals him. But what does Jesus say? You know, a lot of times it's interesting where you will say to people, well, you're healed or whatever the case may be, but he, he says, well, pick up your, your mat and walk. So when Jesus is saying this, pick up your mat and walk, he all of a sudden stands up, he picks up his mat, and he walks. Now, you would think that everybody would be so happy for this man. That everybody would be so excited saying, you know, you know that man, he's just been, you know, he's just part of the landscape. You know, after a while we don't even notice him anymore. Or, or if all of a sudden he weren't there, we would kind of, hey, whatever happened to that guy? He's just part of the landscape. We, 
You know, we're all just used to it. It's, it's normal to have him there. You know, the guy is there every day. It's kind of like driving into a town, and after a while, well, we kind of sort of, we almost didn't even recognize, you know, that crooked sign that probably needs to be taken down. You know, new people moving into town just kind of like, wow, look at that crooked sign. But for the rest of us, oh, we don't even notice it anymore. But Jesus notices this man. He's not the crooked sign that everybody else has just gotten used to. But he notices this man is saying, oh, you're the crooked sign. You're the man who's been here for 38 years and nobody's done anything to help you out. Oh, yeah, the, you know, the sign, and the, you know, it's been out there for 38 years. Matter of fact, life, you know, that sign just is kind of our community's trademark. Our community wouldn't be the same if we didn't have that the same if we didn't have that sign out there. But Jesus notices. And he heals him by just simply saying, Pick up your mat and walk. But for all these people then who who knew him, it's just like, what? The sign's not there anymore? <laughs> oh, that was just. You know, it's become so sentimental. It's almost like one of those things we know we are home when we see the sign. Maybe we should have taken a picture of it before it was taken down. We could tell our kids and grandkids about it. Remember the old sign? Well, here is this guy. It's not like they were so upset that he got to be healed and... You know, you'd think that they'd all be happy for him, and you'd think that they would be praising Jesus and parading him around town, just saying, hey, this is the kind of guy that we want. We want a person in our town that's going to make things better, you know, that are going to heal and improve and make things, well, you know, a lot of times we don't want a guy like that in town because, you know, we, we kind of just want everything status quo, you know, the way things are going. We don't want our neighbors to improve. We just don't know how we're going to survive in this. Matter of fact, maybe some of these things might get cut from us if you know, things improve a little bit more around here. We're just used to having everything the way that it is, and so we'll just keep our, you know, our buildings from being painted and, and our roofs from, uh, to stop from being uh, leaking. And who really had the problem with this? The religious people. The religious people, the people that were living by God, you know, they knew all the rules. And in their heads, they were following all the rules. And so this is maybe part of the fear that a person who's been uh, in this situation for 38 years is like, okay, I'm healed, but now how am I going to survive in this world now that I'm healed? I don't know how to go about this. And more than likely, I'll take a couple of steps and I will already be in trouble. Well, and that's what exactly happens. He takes a couple of steps and everybody's going, Oh, hey, wait a minute. Stop. I'm going to have to give you a ticket. You've taken a couple of steps. No, we're not rejoicing in the fact that you got healed. That's not the issue here. As a matter of fact, we need to figure out who healed you. Because whoever healed you has done a bad thing because you are now walking with your mat, which is, I mean, this is the Sabbath day. You're carrying your mat. That is a work. You are breaking the Sabbath day, and so that is far worse than being an invalid. Okay, well, first of all, was he really breaking the Sabbath day? Here again, I've been to Jerusalem, and that's how strict the laws have gotten. When the Sabbath day begins on Friday evening, when the sun goes down, is that they even have the elevators on automatic, where they just stop at every floor. Why? Because to press an elevator button would be considered to be a work. So you don't want to be breaking the Sabbath. Well, yeah, God gave us, God gave his good laws. And why did he give them to us? To help us so that we can live as a society. Laws are given to help people, not to hurt them. 
And that's a lot of what Jesus in his ministry was trying to point out is that, God, yes, God gave his good laws, but then we make, but over time they would make more laws upon, you know, upon the laws that God had given. Laws upon laws upon laws upon laws to the point where people were suffocating with them. They couldn't even live life. And here was Jesus doing a good thing for this man, but the law now apparently has prohibited this good thing from happening. And so that's one of the things that we always have to realize. What laws are of God and what are man-made laws? Yes, remembering the Sabbath day and keeping it holy, that was God's law. But to carry your mat was not breaking the law. These were man-made laws that they based, you know, based on the law that God had originally given. And so in our society today, we have to think, okay, is this God's law or is this man's law? You know, there was a time when the fishermen were really struggling. And so the way that the church felt that they could help out their fishermen was to say that we will eat fish on Friday. And so, everybody from the church would eat fish on Fridays to help out the fishing industry. But then after the, but then all of a sudden now, that, well, this is getting to be, this is a good discipline. So we're now, you know, this has been all changed to be now like a law. But this is God's law that you only eat, that you eat fish on Fridays. Now here again, I eat fish on Fridays. Why? Not so much because I'm trying to follow one of God's laws as I just like to eat fish. But it doesn't have anything to do with religion. You know, we are saved by Jesus Christ. He is the one who forgives us. We are reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. It's not that we, you know, it's not that we're saved by Jesus and eating fish on Fridays. Do you understand that? And so we shouldn't have all kinds of guilt over a man-made law. Or the same thing when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, you know, kind of had the hippie generation where all of a sudden boys were wearing long hair and everybody's going, oh. I just remember all my coaches in junior high and high school, they're saying they actually had an athletic code where you had to have your hair uh, short. And we weren't to have long hair, and so this was really the law, that we were not allowed to have long hair. And so after a while, I just thought, well, no, this must be God's rule. That God would be upset if I had long hair. No, it's not God's rule. It's our coach's rule. And so here again, yeah, if we're going to play athletics, we better have short hair. But you know, if we want to go to church and have long hair, that's fine. Okay, so that's the thing, is that Jesus is just simply saying, you know, this mat that was carrying this man all these years, now he is carrying. In other words, we do not allow the law to carry us, but rather we are now walking and living by the grace of God. We are walking and living in the Spirit of God. We have been baptized. We have been placed in the pool. That in baptism we die with the Lord and we are raised up to a new life. That's the angels stirring. That's the Holy Spirit stirring in our hearts that we have died to our old self. We have died to the old laws and we've been raised to a new life. We are free. We are free to live our lives and to walk by the Spirit of God. And I'll tell you what, those first couple of steps, people, uh, the devil's going to be right there to say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Do you think you can walk by the Spirit? Hey, go back to the old life. Why don't you sit by the pool and on your mat? Don't listen to the devil. Yeah, we might take a couple of steps and we might fall. Just like learning how to walk physically. We, it takes a, a few times where we tumble and fall, but eventually we begin to walk. And that's the way it is spiritually, as that is we can live and walk by the Spirit. We become stronger and stronger in living our lives in the Spirit of God. And we're living a new way. We're taking a new course. And that journey leads to eternal life. That we are living in relationship with our Heavenly Father 
who shows us mercy. Oh, what a blessed thing. What a blessed thing that it is. And so as he is... <clears throat> so this man now, he doesn't know who healed him. But as he goes to the temple, he finds out it's Jesus. And Jesus just simply said, well, you live and walk by the Spirit and don't use your freedom to fall into sin because that's going to be a lot worse for you than anything. And so that's the thing is that, yeah, we're baptized, but then we spend the rest of our lives getting to know the Father, getting to know Jesus who saves us. Yeah, we're put into the pool of our baptism. We are baptized. And as we grow and live by the Spirit of God, we come to know Jesus more and more. And he was saved. This man was saved. He didn't know who saved him. But now he spends the rest of his life getting to know him to where now not only he, but his whole family now comes to salvation. And so what a powerful story. And this, of course, was the, you know, this was the, sir, the third uh, of Jesus' signs. Is that, Je that he encourages now him to just live this new life. This new life that God has given to him uh, to live and to walk by uh, the Spirit of God. And so what does that look like for us? Well, we are forgiven. We are saved in Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit fills our hearts. And we also take that warning to say that just because we are saved, just because we've been baptized in Jesus' death and resurrection, and even though we're powered by the Holy Spirit, that we just, you know, can't become so arrogant to think that, um, that we don't need God anymore or, that, you know, or to fall back into sin. And so I think so many times that we always have to appreciate the forgiveness that God has given to us and never forget that, to never take it for granted, but to say that now that I've been given this new life, I'm going to live it to God's glory. You know, that we're not going to just take our freedom and, and make a life that's going to be more tragic for us than to be lying by the pool uh, helpless. No, we are beggars before God. We beg his mercy, and he gives us his mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, a practical guide to getting God's direction. Thank you for watching and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.